技咧，就好似生命冇咗水一樣，生存唔到。做生意首先要諗自己覺得過唔過癮先。冇科技係永遠都唔會有創新嘅。Dream it possible， 唔好俾自己有框框，早啲同銀行傾你個計劃，你會早啲完成你嗰個目標。即上恒生商業銀行 YouTube 頻道睇足本分享，實踐創業夢，將不可能變可能。恒生最新商業户口，最快三天開户，全程網上辦妥，立即上網或致電查詢啦。Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the HKTDC Entrepreneur Day 2021. During the three days event, simultaneous interpretation services in English, Cantonese, and Mandarin will be provided. You may select the audio channel next to the video frame, and you're also welcome to raise questions through the Q&A box. Selected questions will be asked at the Q&A section towards the end. Without further ado, the first section, Tea Chat, how to be a global class company and achieve global scale will now begin. And we are very delighted to have Mr. Aaron McDaniel, co-founder of 10X Innovation Lab, to share his insight on international growth for startups. Please welcome Aaron. So, Thank you hi. so much. <laughs> hi, Aaron. Uh, can you clear, he hear us clearly? I can hear you great. Perfect. So, Aaron, the stage is all yours. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. I'm, uh, I'm in California where I live today, and it's great to, to be able to, to virtually uh, meet with people all over the world. Um, on behalf of myself and Klaus Vihe, my uh, co-author of our upcoming book, Global Class, and business partner at 10X, uh, 10X Innovation Lab, I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about um, the research that we've been working on for the last more than a year uh, and helping companies learn how to scale their businesses globally. And so I, I'll start with a, a little bit of a, of a story uh, with a company that, that is pretty well known throughout the world, Walmart. Um, and, and Walmart, uh, despite you know, all of their, um, their, their endless resources and success in the U.S. market, they didn't necessarily find success all over the world. Um, they believed in the company way, the Walmart way of doing things. And what that meant was low prices. That was their big value proposition. Uh, and, and they brought a lot of different products that were pretty prominent in the U.S., like prepackaged meats. And they had a very particular way of engaging customers, very friendly, both at the checkout stand and people at the front of the store waving and saying hello to everyone. And when they went into the German market, they matched this Walmart way of doing things in, in the German market and, and ended up finding that their low prices value proposition didn't really affect German citizens much because the prices they had were already lower. Uh, then when it came to prepackaged meats, it was something that Germans didn't trust very much. They liked to actually go to a local butcher, be able to see the meat before it was prepackaged and, and sometimes see the animal that it came from. And then when it came to customer engagement, while having that friendly face waving and, and greeting you in the United States was, was something that culturally was welcomed, uh, it freaked out a lot of Germans. <laughs> so they were, they were kind of scared, like, who is this like being so friendly to me? And, and so ultimately, they weren't successful. And in the process, lost well over a billion dollars. And so uh, I guess the first piece of advice I have for you is don't be like Walmart. And so instead, we want to share with you a little bit about what you can do uh, in, uh, in the face of expanding your business to new countries. And uh, what we found, Klaus and I, as we were doing our research, was that there was no lean startup, no good to great, no zero to one, no blitz scaling book on international business expansion. And so that set us out on this journey 
to figure out why that was and, and to figure out what the key is to expanding your business into new markets. And, and so ultimately what our goal is, is very similar to what Eric Reese, who's pictured here, did with the lean startup. So Eric was not the one who invented the lean methodology or agile methodology. Uh, you know, it, it went back decades based in Kaizen principles, but he was one of the first to bring together a common set of frameworks and common vocabulary as it related to the agile methodology and, it, and iterating as you build a company. And so we wanna do that. We wanna create that common language and common set of frameworks when it comes to building global businesses. And so in the process, uh, we have interviewed more than 200 ex 250 executives from uh, some of the top companies across the world, uh, over 50 countries uh, they, they come from. And so, you know, a very wide range, everything from the former head of international at Apple, who had a $100 billion P&L, all the way to the very first person who entered the market in a number of different markets for Uber, the first guy on the ground, one of their launchers who launched their markets from um, companies in uh, in Asia, we spoke to a, um, one of the co-founders of Rakuten, senior executive at Line, um, also Amazon, LinkedIn, Canva, Talabot from the Middle East, um, entrepreneurs and business executives from from Africa, and a, a number of unicorn companies in uh, in Latin America as well. And in in all of this process, what we really learned is that most of these executives we talked to and most of these companies were reinventing the wheel. So they didn't have a set of common frameworks. They didn't have a, a way of doing things. They, they literally had to figure it out as they went along. And, and naturally, as you can imagine, a lot of mistakes were made. Uh, a lot of money was wasted. A lot of time was wasted in the process. And it particularly came into really good perspective for us when we spoke to executives who previously had been at McKinsey, Bain and Boston consulting groups, these top consulting firms. And they told us that they didn't have frameworks from some of these best consulting firms that executives look to. And so that led us on this journey to want to create these frameworks. Uh, the other reason we, we think that now is a great time to share this message is because of the pandemic and the business world that we're living in now. We, we think that the pandemic represents a shift in business, very similar to that of the dot-com boom from a couple of decades ago where if you look back at the dot-com boom, companies born before versus after thought, acted, operated very differently. And in particular, those that took advantage of the power of the internet and, and software were the ones who disrupted a lot of industries and, and had been successful at building these large-scale businesses. And so we think that the pandemic, uh, there's an opportunity for companies to rethink how they operate, take advantage of things like distributed work, and ultimately take advantage of the fact that it's often easier now to access different customers uh, across borders across the world. Uh, we also realized that, that with this, this shift that's happening, the mindset is changing. And, and this is from a, a recent um, Accenture survey and 82% of the executives they spoke with um, basically realized that their business was more operating like a federated group of different enterprises or products instead of one centralized monolith command and control type structure. And 71% of executives have already started to decentralize their uh, decision-making, um, which, which is a great sign for, for what this next generation of, of business will be globally. Uh, we also found that international is really as make or break for your business as finding product market fit in your initial market. It's this, this time where you figure out if your company is just made for one market and that's it, there's, there's the only country you're really going to find scale and fit in, or if this is something that can really be spread across the whole globe. And that's why it's important to, to think about it in a certain way, to think about it from very early on uh, and, and plan accordingly. And, and some of the information that I'll be sharing today will be able to help you, um, you know, learn what to do to, to make the most of that opportunity. Uh, as we did our research, we found that a lot of companies, they, they basically, um, they, they found that this, this applied to them in particular when they're just starting on their journey to expand in new markets, but also when they are actually in a few markets already and they've created a few problems because they were often figuring things out as they went along and reinventing the wheel. And so uh, no matter where you're at in your journey, if you are just growing your business in one market for now, or you've already 
uh, entered a few markets and you're starting to understand some of the things that and the complexities that, that I'll be talking about, um, you know, th this is something that can really apply for, for you and your business. And so in, in the process of doing our research, we, we found 10 key reasons why international expansion initiatives fail. And so I, I'll go through these real quick um, so we can spend some other times more on the solution side, but building the wrong team, you need to have the right type of employees, team members, executives, really everybody involved needs to have the right mindset, right skill set in order to be successful. Uh, we, we found that, that companies of all sizes, they sometimes rush through what we call the localization discovery process, which is basically where you go and you research in market and talk to key stakeholders. Some just do their research from headquarters. They assume that, uh, that the, the data that they found is, is accurate, and then, and then they go forward with launching. But it's really important to go in market. Uh, the other thing, and very similar to the story that I started with, with, with Walmart, is companies that didn't build for localization. They said, we're going to do things the exact same way that we did them in, in our initial market, our home market. And oftentimes that fails. Number four, not managing complexity. So once you get to a few countries, if you are not mindful about this complexity, then all of a sudden you're having to manage five, 10 different models. And it makes it very hard to manage your business and create scale. Uh, another often found issue is, is bringing in the wrong first customers, uh, attempting to only serve customers in a new country that you're already serving from your home market, or only going for maybe bigger customers and wasting a lot of research or resources, excuse me, instead of finding some early wins. And so it's important to find those right customers. It's also important uh, to revisit the agile methodology, but a very specific type. And, and I'm going to be talking about that in a few minutes. And introducing a, a new process that you can use to sort of put a global filter on agile. Another mistake that often is made that leads to failure is, is maintaining this us versus them mentality where, where the, um, the headquarters is thought of as one way or is maybe favored over, um, over the, um, the local markets. And, and, and to that point, number eight, favoring one over the other. Then it's really important also to build structures to create momentum around your expansion journeys. And then finally, what's often not thought about is universalizing your core values. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk through and address how to have solutions and avoid some of these failures. So in all of this, we introduced this new concept that we call a global class company. And this global class company has a specific mindset. We're also gonna be talking about what they do who they're made up of in terms of people, and then ultimately how they do it. And we'll introduce some, some frameworks to be able to help in the process. And so as we have, uh, have done our research, we, we've heard the, the saying uh, occasionally that a company should be born global. We don't really think that's an accurate depiction of how it specifically should work. Uh, you, you can't really just be launched instantaneously in multiple markets at once. We have seen that these companies that are successful still find product market fit, scale, and validation in, in an initial market. But what these global class companies do is they think global day one, meaning they build their teams, their processes, their products, their strategies, uh, even their core values in a way that can be localized and or universalized. We also found these global class companies have a different way of looking at talent. So um, the traditional way of doing things might have been the centralized strategy. Everybody is at a headquarters. Over time, that migrated to this other notion of a clustered strategy, like, oh, we need to get cybersecurity expertise on the team. Let's go hire a group of 10 or 20 people in Israel. As an example, there's a lot of expertise in cybersecurity there. But as we've gone through the pandemic, things have changed. Distributed work has has really accelerated. And so global class companies are able to build these decentralized teams and be able to find even individual employees going where that talent is. They don't restrict themselves just to one geographic area. They see that they can bring in a team across the whole world. And then subsequently, they use that local market knowledge to gain understanding and ultimately entry into new markets. There's also this new notion of what role headquarters plays. So traditionally, there's been a little bit more of a command and control headquarters telling local market teams what to do. But ultimately, there's this opportunity, especially accelerated by, by the pandemic, for headquarters to be more of an enabler 
and supporter. Uh, and part of that is because the traditional view of what headquarters is, is changing. For a lot of companies, it's not a physical place where all of the decision-making structure is located because companies have began hiring more of distributed teams or, or some like Twitter, they've gone as far as saying they're a fully remote team. And, and so ultimately what the strategy is, is it's not doing things the company way like Walmart, but doing things the local way. And so what do these companies do? Ultimately, they localize. And that's not just a matter of language translation. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. These companies are able to localize all different parts of their business. And, and to give it an example, to put this in perspective, we heard a great story from Zendesk, a customer care um, platform that uh, companies all across the world use. Um, Zendesk is a very community-minded company. They're headquartered in San Francisco, where, uh, where Klaus and I live. And, um, and Around where they live, there around where their excuse me, their, their headquarters is is in this area called the Tenderloin, where there are a lot of homeless people, and so they're a very community-minded company. Their their area of impact is homelessness. Well, they then opened up an office in Singapore, and uh, the Singaporean employees were like, "This is great, but we don't really have homelessness where we are. It, it, this doesn't resonate with us." And so, uh, but but I guess at the another area that there is need is is um, when you hit around age 62 by government mandate, you're sort of pushed out of the workforce. So senior citizens tend to feel more isolated and have a higher level of depression. And so this was important to the Singaporean team. So they were even able to localize their community mindedness for a specific market. Then there's the who. So, so these global class companies, who do they build their teams of people uh, with? And um, if you look at this pyramid, uh, what, what we want to introduce is this new concept that we call being an interpreneur, as an international. And so if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, that's the agile mindset, being entrepreneurial, which has been around for, for decades. Over the last 10 or 15 years, companies have wanted these, these people who are able to have this agile mentality, but be able to work within the existing constructs of, a, of an existing company. Um, so being able to be more of an intrapreneur, deal with the bureaucracy complexity of an existing organization. But what hasn't been talked about as much that we think and, and our research has indicated is going to be this mindset and, and skill set of the next decade is a cultural mindset, a global mindedness, a cultural curiosity, cultural sensitivity, the ability to have empathy, to understand a new market and be able to localize the business to be able to gain traction and scale in that market. And, uh, and so we really want to to lift up on a pedestal a few of the, the people we've interviewed who have really shown this, what we think to be the, the future mindset of global business leaders. And so as an example, in the, uh, the bottom right on the screen, that's Abe Smith, he's head of international at Zoom. And, uh, and he's built his career around international expansion. And, and one of the more interesting things about our research is that we found that a lot of the people who've gravitated toward international business have these formative experiences that change how they view the world. And so uh, Abe is from America, um, but shortly after college, he went to teach English at a tiny Japanese fishing village. And that just opened his eyes up to the fact that there's a world beyond his backyard. And so ultimately that, that led him on his journey. And, and it's important to build a team who, who has this agile mindset, but also has this cultural mindset as well. And then finally, the how. And, and there's a multi-stage process that we've developed that you can go through all the way from determining whether you're ready to expand to actually doing the research, building a plan, launching, and ultimately scaling your business. And we built a set of tools to be able to, um, to complement the various stages of that process. And I want to talk about a, a few of them at first. And so um, if you look at the red framing on the outside of this image, these are what we call the four essential commitments uh, to be successful in, in building a global business. And so what they are, are first headquarters resource commitment. And so uh, both people and funding, um, and, and just like enterprise software companies have a total cost of expansion equation they often look at, um, we, we have a, or excuse me, a total cost of ownership equation when they're selling to customers. We, we have a total cost of expansion equation that talks about you know, um, basically your total cost of market entry. So when you're launching in a market, you have to plan accordingly to have the right, um, the, the, the right uh, resources set aside. Then on the, on the right side, there are clear performance metrics, which are really important. And, and you, you kind of have to go back to that 
um, agile mentality, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, um, where you're not looking at key metrics like revenue or profit when you first enter a market, but more things like understanding the customer better, understanding what localizations are needed, um, and, and some initial traction, and, and that's you know, a better focus. At the bottom, there is autonomy and trust. It's really important that local teams are given a, an amount of autonomy, autonomy and, and trust granted from headquarters in order to understand how to localize the business for that market. And in that context, we, we also see what we refer to as the pendulum. And, and that's that different functions as you expand go from being centralized to localized and regionalized and back and forth depending on where you're at and the type of company that you have. And then finally at the top, communication and clarity. And, and uh, one of the key vehicles of this communication and clarity is feedback loops. So, um, and, and, and this is from headquarters translating core values and, um, and company culture to local teams. And then the local teams having the channels to be able to share localizations that, uh, and key market insights to help with the localization for different markets. And one of the hallmarks of global class companies is it's, it's this two-way communication that's happening. And in particular, when there's an interesting insight or, or way of doing things that's learned for a specific market, global class companies know how to take that information back and actually spread it across their whole global footprint to really optimize and, uh, and better the scale globally as opposed to just keeping it to that one market. Um, and then um, along those lines, um, what, what you have to do is, is go through this new flavor of agile, this global flavor of agile. And the reason why you have to look at agile a little differently as you go to different markets is because one of the core tenets of the agile methodology is you create hypotheses, you then iterate, and you keep going and you keep adapting and adapting and adapting until you find the right product market fit. Now, that's great when you're doing that for one market. Right, because that's just one model that you need to pivot toward. Well, if you do that for 10 different markets and you use that, that pure agile methodology, then you have 10 different uh, models that you have to manage, which again, can be very, very difficult and very hard to scale. And so what you have to do is go back and label the initial market validated model. And, and one great way to do that is to use the business model canvas in those nine different quadrants, label those as hypotheses and then ultimately run them through two key filters to come up with the new set of hypotheses to test and iterate on for a new market. And, and those two key filters are government and regulation and culture, because often government regulation and culture are changing how you would operate these different parts of your business. So, you know, as an example, um, we'll, we'll use the key partner quadrant from the business model canvas. Well, uh, in some countries, you are not allowed as an international company to fully own uh, an entity. You need to have a local JV partner. And so that would be a government example of the key partner category that would affect your go-to-market and the need for having a key partner. On the culture side, we heard a, a great case study from DocuSign, the e-signature company. Um, if they had taken more of the company way of doing things or, or the traditional disruption model and viewpoint, they probably wouldn't have been as successful as they have been in Japan. And uh, what they decided to do, instead of saying, you know, and, and many of you may be familiar, in Japan, they don't have handwritten signatures. They, they, what's common is the Honko stamp. Um, and so ultimately, the, instead of saying, oh, these, these Honkos are a, a way of the past, we're the new way of doing things, we're disrupting the Honko system, they understood the cultural significance and decided to partner with a physical Honko stamp maker. Uh, so they didn't have to go to the Honko maker. Um, and, and in some respects, you know, that, that Hunkle Maker was not a technology company. You know, they gave away maybe some of their margin in the process of partnering. But doing that and creating a digital version of the Hunko was very important and ultimately uh, led to great growth and, uh, and very quick traction within the Japanese market. Now, all of this localization, as I've sort of been dancing around, also creates some complexity, that complexity that if you don't manage things properly, then ultimately you would be in a position where, uh, where you create all of these different models that are very hard to manage. And so in order to handle that, basically um, we, we, we basically saw um, something that, that needed a solution because a lot of people basically thought about complexity after the problem was created uh, or different team members had a very myopic 
narrow view of localization. If they were in product, they just thought of product localization. If they were on the legal side, they just thought of different legal parts of, of the business. If they were on the marketing side, they just thought of marketing changes instead of looking at things more holistically. It also was very difficult to communicate at a board level or C level what localizations were needed for a market. And so ultimately what we created is what we call the localization premium tool. And, and what this is, is it's a visualization and an exercise you go through to help you determine how your business might need to change in order to enter new markets. It, so it can help you choose what markets to, to go into. It can help you um, create the right sequence of markets to go into, what's the right order to create that scale and momentum, and also do communication. And so just to translate the chart real quick, um, basically the, the product market fit in your initial market is in the middle, but you have to deviate away from that, that core validated model in order to get fit in a new market. There are different elements that are more external or go to market facing on the top, and then others that are more internal or operational on the bottom. And there's a very detailed analysis tool that we have as, as part of our content uh, that you would use. So it's not just a matter of picking little, little spaces to, to, uh, to put the dots on. There's a very detailed tool that can be very helpful in going through this exercise. But, but ultimately, just to show you the holistic look at things, first, the, uh, if we start in the top left, the marketing premium is essentially um, differences in value proposition, differences in use case, differences in, 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 in um, advertising channel to go to a new market. Sales premium at the top, differences in pricing and uh, revenue model, differences in customer service, differences in competitive landscape, even differences in target customer. To the, to the right, product premium differences in uh, product or features. We, we heard a great story from LinkedIn as they went uh, early on into India they saw that the mobile network was you know, a 2G network, not a four or 5G network. And so their app didn't load very well on that mobile network. So they had to create a new version they internally called LinkedIn Lite that was a text-based version of the app that then allowed them to get a lot of traction in the uh, India market. The bottom right admin premium, that's differences in, uh, in regulation and compliance uh, requirements, whether you have to create a new corporate entity, intellectual property, taxation, currency exchange. At the bottom, organization premium, whether you have to um, create a new team to serve that market or you have existing resources. Differences in business culture can, can change things. Also, you have a limited amount of resources as a startup company. And so you are taking resources away from your home market to focus on that new market. And then finally, infrastructure premium, which for a physical product is supply chain. For a software product are things like uh, tech stack. If you go into Germany, as an example, uh, in other countries, you have to stand up a new tech stack because uh, uh, citizens' data has to stay in country. And so just a few examples real quick. This is an example with Apple going into Brazil. Um, because in Brazil, taxes make an iPhone five times the price as it would be in, in the US and in other countries, they had to completely change their whole retail layout to be more genius bar service focused instead of sales focused. That, that changed their payback metrics and break even analysis. Um, they also had to hire and train a new type of employee that was a, a little different than normal. Um, another thing that we find is what we call a proximity bias or familiarity fallacy. And that's often that it's best to go to countries that are nearby geographically or that speak the same language. And that doesn't always mean it's the case. And so we had a, a great uh, case study we got from Square where when they expanded into the UK and Australia, which often US companies will think, yeah, let's go to the, the UK and Australia because they speak English. Well, ultimately not only were the models very different than the US, but they were very different than each other. And so they weren't necessarily able to scale as fast because they had to deal with some of these issues. And so sometimes it might be better for other countries, not ones that are as geographically close or not ones that have the same language. And then another concept uh, that we have a great story from Airbnb is, is what we label as an influencer market. And so Airbnb saw Korea as an influencer market for Japan and China because Japanese and Chinese consumers, a lot of them look to Koreans for the next hot thing. So by Airbnb prioritizing the Korea market and localizing for that market, then when they went to Japan and China after, the amount of complexity they incurred, how much they had to deviate from that new model they were operating was not as big. And so they were able to create more momentum and scale faster. And so uh, 
just as, as we come close to a close, I'm looking forward to hearing some of your questions. Um, but just a quick case study, a, a global class company that, that we like to talk about is, is Canva, headquartered in Australia. Uh, this is Melanie Perkins, one of the co-founders. And uh, they're a great example of a company that was thinking global day one. So they built their product uh, in a way that was very flexible and could be localized. Um, so it was easier for them because of how they built the product to have different language translations. They had local iconography and imaging and templates. Uh, they also built a very diverse team uh, just within the couple hundred employees that uh, are in the headquarters in, um, in Sydney, Australia, uh, over 70 languages, I believe, were spoken. Uh, their culture, they also made a very strong effort to universalize their core values so that that core value set didn't just resonate with employees who sat in Australia, but really would resonate worldwide. They also saw headquarters role as more of an enabler and supporter and did their best, uh, even to the point of, of not having separate Slack channels that were, that were named to headquarters and focused on people just at headquarters, but looked to be able to activate a more distributed workforce. And, and ultimately, a lot of this stemmed from Melanie and, and her co-founder and, um, and top executives' entrepreneurial mindset. And so um, another thing that we're doing as, as part of writing our book is, uh, is looking to find ways to bring together a community of uh, global businesses and global business leaders, because while the entrepreneurial community is very well connected, the international business expansion community isn't as much so. And we're constantly looking for ways to be able to help connect people and help you build your businesses by connecting you with veterans like the Abe Smiths of the world who have a lot of experience scaling businesses. And so um, super excited to, uh, to get the opportunity to speak to you. We would love to stay in touch. Klaus and our, uh, in my contact information are there at the bottom. You can also learn more about the book and, and activate and access, excuse me, some of these resources at globalclassbook.com. And uh, otherwise I'm excited to open up the floor for a uh, question and answer. So thank you, Aaron, for the insightful sharing and solving us some of the myths of setting up an international business, definitely. So please stay online as well as we'll move on to the Q&A section. So for our audience viewing online, you are still welcome to raise questions through the Q&A box right next to the video frame. So to start off, we have a questions on we have questions on localizations and how we deviate from the core of the brand image. So the question for Aaron is, how to strive a balance between localization and a consistent brand image? Sure, so um, th there are lots of elements to that. That is a, a great question. And, and um, Klaus and I were actually just recording a, uh, a podcast today with um, Catherine Himes, who, who was uh, head of international product for, um, for Slack, and we were talking about how it's a huge decision to decide, especially if you're building a, a software-based product, whether to fork the product and essentially create two different versions, one for one market, one for another. And, um, and so you know, what, what we typically suggest, and, and this was a great idea that we had heard from uh, Frederick, who is um, the uh, CEO founder of Blah Blah Car, uh, the world's largest uh, carpooling app. Uh, he talked about this notion how it, at, um, at Blablacar, they built for two markets from the beginning. So uh, they started in France, uh, but from the very beginning, they built their product so that it would function very well in Spain. And so, um, and so, you know, different language, but nearby geographically, but they saw a lot of similarities of the carpool uh, culture in those two countries. And by them building with more than one market in mind, they were able to build their product in such a way that, um, that it wasn't solely tailored to the French market, making it harder for them to adapt for other markets. And so th that's at a product level, but to your question around branding, um, you can still have um, a similar brand image. Uh, you can universalize some of those core values that, that not only translate to you and your company and how you run things, but also to how you appeal to customers. And so um, you know, that, that's a very useful tool to be able to if you think about what value propositions that your product provides that are more universal, it allows you to be able to have more of that um, universal brand image across multiple countries. And if you have that as a basis, then you can do different localization from that more universal base, uh, more universal basis, if that makes sense. 
Thank you, Aaron. So we have another question for you. So the question is, um, with cognitive AI as globalization based on your model work? Yeah. Um, not sure I understand the question. Um, so we, we, you're asking if, if, if this, this methodology would work for a cognitive AI yes, company yes. or? Yeah, so, so we, we very intentionally designed all of these tools and, and frameworks and mindset to not be, you know, just, just for Silicon Valley companies, as an example, where, where Klaus and I are from, but something that would be universal for companies of all type across the world. And so we talked to um, entrepreneurs from every continent. We talked to companies that had physical products, that had software products, that were doing B2B and B2C. And ultimately, these core tenants, and if you go back to the, um, the spider charts here, the, um, the localization premium analysis, all of these apply no matter what type of company um, you have. Now, depending on your product set and what drives your company, if you're more of an engineering-driven company, more of a brand-driven company, more of a product-driven company, um, that may affect what your North Star is and how you go about doing things. But it's, no matter what, you can still use these tools to create that more holistic view it's just depending on the type of company you have you might favor one of these quadrants more than others and and ultimately create that that um, sequence of countries you want to go to based on certain sub segments here um, but yes it, it whether you know cognitive ai no matter no matter what industry you're in it's something that, that this can apply and be helpful for you Thank you, Aaron. So we have another question for you. So do you think technology is crucial when a company is expanding worldwide? Yeah, so uh, you know that, that's one of the things that, that we found because of the pandemic, adoption of a lot of different trends accelerated. And distributed work definitely accelerated because a lot of us, we, we couldn't physically be in the same building together. And so that really helped further the adoption and advancement of, of a number of these tools. And so technology play, plays a very central role, um, but it's, it's important to utilize technology to keep those human connections. Um, so especially amongst the team and, and even to a certain extent, targeting your customer base. And so look at technology as not something to hide behind, but really as a tool to help further make those human connections and and be able to, like we were talking about with, with one of the four commitments, create those feedback loops so that people are communicating different things to each other. And, and so that's where various um, structures are created. We didn't talk about this in, in too much detail, but everything from playbooks to, um, to internal teams that help support the global expansion initiatives, all of those are important and technology can help further that. But ultimately we should think about technology as tools to help you know, the, the human element of things, the whole human connection that is still important and particularly important with, with distributed teams and as you build out a distributed customer base. Thank you, Aaron. So we have another question from Alan. So um, in a startup situation and a COVID situation, which restricts traveling, what are your best tips to explore international market given the local tour might not work well now? Sure. So uh, I, I firmly believe, and I, I believe my co-author Klaus agrees with me on this. Um, if it wasn't for the pandemic, we probably would not have been able to talk to 250 executives from 50 countries. Um, the pandemic and, and everything that's happened with that has actually allowed a lot of people to lower their barriers where, uh, you know, they have more time. Maybe they're not commuting as much. It's easier to pop on, you know, a, a Zoom meeting or other other video platform. And so um, while you may not be able to go uh, for a period of time and look at the market, um, you know, more, more directly in person, it's easier um, if you put in the effort and hustle to connect with more of the people who are in that market. So at some point, it still is important to go physically see that market, but you can do a lot virtually. And it, 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 we have found it to be easier to connect with people in different markets because they tend to be more accessible because of the pandemic. Right, thank you, Aaron. So we have another question. Ooh, it's a recent buzzword. So Metaverse, as you may have known. Uh, so what's your view on it and how your business should move around the different worlds? Oh man, that's, that's a great <laughs> question. I, I, I don't necessarily know if I've 
formulated my opinions on on you know what what that will look like and, and what role it will play. I, I think that um, to the point of of technology that we spoke about before as being a, a method for facilitating human connections and the human element that goes into to building your cust- uh, your your company and and delivering your value proposition to customers. I, I think it can be another great tool that can offer a more immersive experience and, and another channel in order to reach people. I think I think it it um, maybe takes some of those barriers that still kind of exist to reach people uh, who are in a distributed fashion, customers in other places, employees in other places, and, um, and create, um, you know, m- more of that connection and, and lower those barriers and make people closer, even though they're physically apart, just because of how that, you know, immersive, a, a metaverse type experience can be. So I think it can be useful. I might, I think that the question will be what, what the timeline looks like for that and whether it's the right um, investment that your company should be making right now with the limited resources you have. But I think as we look longer term, it, it, it can be something that, that uh, can definitely be game changer. Right, right. So we have another question. Oh, so do you have any study or like interesting findings for Netflix? Uh, any, anything interesting findings for what? I'm sorry? For Netflix. Like the video streaming platform for Netflix, right? Sure. Um, so you know, we 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 didn't specifically speak to any executives from Netflix in our um, in our um, markets, but but uh, you know, we we have seen how they've been successful in localizing their business for different markets, and so uh, a lot of that comes with um, with localizing content, um, and so. Uh, you know, this is something that one, one company we did an interview is Roku, and they made a very specific effort to get local content far in advance from them entering new markets so that they could better connect with, um, with customers in the local markets. But a, a great uh, telltale sign of, you know, that hallmark of being a global class company that we saw in Netflix is, is the two-way nature of their content. And so for Netflix, they didn't just think to themselves purely like we're we're going to take American and English content and spread that all over the world. But they've they've realized that there are a lot of great artists and creators in different countries, and have found ways to bring you know other you know other than English language content to the rest of the world. And so you know that's a great example of a localization they had had, and um, and and not just localizing one way but having that innovation go both ways and, and learning what was good in, in other markets and bringing that to the markets that they already were in. Right. Thank you, Aaron. So I think we should have another question. So do you suggest to partner with the overseas corporates when penetrating the overseas market or like they starting their own branch there? You know, that's that's one of the uh, the great questions. And I, I have to say just in general, your guys' questions are great. So I really appreciate these. Um, I, I don't think there is a right answer uh, that is really universal. I think it's it's a part of the process, and, and this this gets into a little bit of the um, step one and step two of the international expansion process, where you start with an internal analysis and you ask yourself different questions, like, are we ready to expand in new markets? What are the key drivers behind it? What indications are we seeing that we should be entering these other markets? Is it organic growth we're seeing there? Or, or some other reason to access talent, whatever it might be. And so um, that's an important part process to go through. And, and as you go through that, you have to determine what is important to you, what is negotiable, what is non-negotiable. Uh, if you look at the more detailed analysis behind the, um, the localization premium tool and these spider charts here, um, one of those is, is looking at what different aspects of your business are most important. What do you need to own end to end what don't you? And so, you know, to, to use a, a great example, I think we all understand of, of a company who wants to own things end to end, it was Apple. And uh, in speaking to the former head of international at Apple, they were interested in expanding in um, United Arab Emirates and in Dubai. Well, at the time in Dubai, you had to have a local JV partner in order to enter the market. And so they decided to hold off on entering the market until they were given an exception to be able to be a wholly owned uh, enterprise in uh, in Dubai, in, in United Arab Emirates. And so they made the choice not to have a local partner because, um, because you know, that 
they, they believed in owning that full end-to-end -end customer experience. Now, that obviously meant that they scaled maybe a little slower than if they were able to plug in to an existing distribution network, but that was important to them. Um, one of the uh, executives we interviewed, Paul Williamson from Plaid, chief, chief revenue officer there, uh, financial services uh, company, sort of fintech next generation company. He talked about how um, you know, finding a partner, it, it's almost like, like we, we've heard this with, with co-founders, with investors, like it's like a marriage, right? You want someone who almost, you know, the way he described it is you could switch roles with that local partner. And if they were put in charge of making decisions at your company, and you were put in charge of making decisions at their company, you would think very similar and make very similar decisions. So that's how tight you would need to be with a partner. Um, and so he encouraged doing things like making it not a quick process to choose what partner to work with, but make it a longer term process and have multiple meetings where you're asking the same question multiple times to see if the answers change. It's also important to find that right balance. You know, you don't just want another startup who doesn't have resources and, and might be at risk of failing. But at the same time, if you choose too big of a local partner, they might see their partnership with you as not something that's that important. And so it's important to find that right balance. But I guess to, to go back to the beginning of my answer, the, the start of it comes with you determining what parts of your business you need to own end to end and which ones that you can sacrifice a little bit of that to gain some speed and acceleration in the market by plugging into a partner's existing network. Right, right. Thank you, Aaron. So we have another buzzword question. So do you think NFT will actually replace physical products in the future? Oh, that's, I, I think there is, there is always going to be a, a place for physical products. Um, I think that things like NFT can create a, a bridge between the physical and digital. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's a, a parallel track that is going to you know, create a new digital world of different things. But I almost, I, I don't know the, the psychology behind it, but I think there's just a, an element to human nature around the tangibility of different things. And so there's always gonna be physical products in some perspective, but, but basically I, I guess maybe another way to say it is, I don't think physical products versus NFT and digital products is a, a single pie that is going to be split, but it, with NFTs, it's something that's gonna expand the pie and create a lot of opportunities for new businesses to come in and take advantage of the trend. So thank you so much, Aaron. That's a wrap for the Q&A section. I'm, and I'm sure that the audience would definitely learn a lot from it, from your insights and the sharing. And surely that's a long way to go for everyone, uh, like even entrepreneurs to start their own businesses internationally. So um, please feel free to scan the QR code on the screen to send us your feedback and stay connected with our smart advisor to explore any possibility. So our next section will start at 11 a.m. And thank you for watching. And don't forget, we still have another concurrent event, Smart Biz Expo, on the line waiting for you. Thank you.